Thank you very much, uh, Professor Noda, for this kind introduction. Um, first of all, let me uh, thank the organizers of this symposium for inviting me here. It's obviously a very great uh, honor. So I'll be talking today about photonic integrated circuits and uh, give some examples of their use for the internet and for the life sciences. But before I do that, let me um, spend just one minute to bring to your attention that actually 2015 has been declared the International Year of Light and Light-Based Technologies. And that has been done by UNESCO. Um, one of the reasons I think that uh, light is brought to the level of being uh, chosen for a year of light is that in our daily lives, actually all of us use a lot of light-enabled technologies. Here you see a multitude of examples. There is optical fiber communications, of course. There is energy applications. There is lighting. There is photovoltaics. We heard about photovoltaics uh, this afternoon. There is all sorts of displays. There is all sorts of laser-based technologies. And in, the, in, in medicine, there is immunoassays, there is uh, pulse oximetry, there is eye surgery, uh, surgery. So there's a multitude of applications that make use of light. And what I'll be talking about today is actually to go one step further and try to make optical chips, photonic integrated circuits, combine a lot of optical functions on a chip in the same way as we have been doing it in electronics for the past 50 years. So, what is a photonic integrated circuit? It's an optical chip made with the technologies that were originally actually developed for electronic chips, um, so-called CMOS technology. All the computer chips in our laptops and, and all the chips in our mobile devices, they're all made of silicon electronics of a technology called uh, CMOS technology. And this is how it's done. You take a, a fab, a clean room, and on, on wafers you process devices, then that gives you a chip. Uh, and in, in my case, that will be an optical chip. And then you put it in a package and you're ready to use it. So if you do all that, you have something that enables a complex and sophisticated optical functionality in a compact way and at low cost. So why does all of this, all of this matter? Well, I have two cases here. One is, one is indeed internet and the other one is life sciences. In the case of the internet, the internet is beautiful and we can do a lot of good things with it. However, there is one problem, and that is that the energy consumption by the internet is actually increasing exponentially. This is a graph showing that indeed uh, the, evol the evolution of energy usage by just data centers is going exponential. So obviously we have to do something about that, and one of the solutions is to make more use of optical fiber communication and to reduce the power consumption of that and, and, and the size of these uh, devices to make it all happen at lower energy consumption. The second, uh, the second application here is life science. In the field of life science, we have an improving uh, healthcare solutions, in, at least in the Western world. However, once the, the downside of all of this is that the cost of health healthcare is actually increasing. And again, that is something unsustainable. And therefore, there is an increased need for affordable solutions, point of care solutions, especially at the site of prevention and early detection of uh, medical conditions. So this is sort of the context of my talk, and in both cases, um, photonic integrated circuits, as you will see, provide uh, one part of the answer to these problems. So to uh, give some structure to the presentation, I'll briefly introduce photonic integrated circuits in some more detail, and then I'll move to internet applications, and after that I'll move to life science applications. So what is a photonic integrated circuits without going into all the details of this picture. Um, it's a chip on which you have a lot of optical elements that can go from um, lasers and detectors, of course, and, and, and modulators, modulators converting an electrical signal into an optical signal, um, and various other optical devices. But invariably, of course, you will understand that there is a need to interconnect the, the different devices, not by electrical wires, but by optical wires, we call them photonic wires. So that's the first thing I want to talk about briefly. How can we make a wire for light 
on a chip and make it very, very compact and small. Well, we get inspiration here from the optical fiber. In an optical fiber, you have this cylindrical structure where you have a core and a, and a cladding around it. It's all made of glass uh, with a small difference in the refractive index between the core and the cladding. And it all works on the basis of what is called total internal reflection, where light rays is actually bouncing back from the interface of the core to the cladding and bouncing back, back and forth uh, in this core. And in that way, you can transport light. That's how the internet works. Typically, these single mode fibers have an outer diameter of 125 micrometers. That's about the size of a human hair. But the core, where it all happens, is only 8 to 10 micrometers. Now, 8 to 10 micrometers may sound small. However, it's still by far too large for doing the same on an optical chip, which is already tiny in its own right. So when we build wires on, an, on a chip, we typically do it in this way. We take a little strip of silicon, which actually has a very high refractive index, surrounded by a layer of silicon oxide, which is glass with a low refractive index. And here you see that the difference between refractive index of the core and the cladding, light is really propagating through the strip of silicon, is much larger than an optical fiber. And that's the basis by which we can miniaturize these photonic wires rather dramatically. You see here actually a cross-section of such a wire, and you see that the width of this wire for light is only 500 nanometers, not 10 micrometers, 500 nanometers, and the thickness is perhaps 200 nanometers. And this is where we propagate light through in a so-called single mode fashion. Actually superimposed, I'll go back, this is the waveguide and superimposed on the waveguide here is a field plot of the electromagnetic field distribution in such a wire in the so-called TE mode. And you see that light is really condensed in, an, in a rather extreme way uh, in this uh, wire for light. Okay, now what is also nice about the fact that we use these very tiny structures with a high refractive index contrast between the core and the cladding is that you can make very, very sharp bends. So typically, obviously, we want to route signals around the chip, so we need bends. The nice thing about these silicon wires is that the bend radius can become very, very small. And, and again, that's the result of this very tight confinement in the waveguide. What you see here is as a, as a function of the radius of curvature. This is five micrometers, this is three, this is just one micrometer. I'm plotting here the, the losses induced by these, uh, by these bends. Light actually likes to travel straight ahead. So it has to do something special to go around the bend. But in this case, it works perfectly well. You see, for example, for a radius of curvature of three micrometers, the loss for a 90 degree bend is only 0.02 dB. Believe me, 0.02 dB is a very, very small loss. So this works very nicely. So that means that now we can look at this picture. You can make spirals of light, and, and these are very, very sharp bends. And almost without loss, you can route light around a chip. And that means that we can now, we are in, in good shape to start making photonic integrated circuits. We can route light signals around in a very, very compact way. Um, now, I mentioned already a few times silicon. Silicon is a very prominent material. There are other materials that do the same, but silicon is a very prominent one for two very big reasons. One is what I already mentioned, the high refractive index contrast between in core and cladding. It's really key to make very compact chips. But the primary reason is really that you can fall back on CMOS technology. For 50 years, this world has been developing silicon microelectronics. And now the photonics world is piggybacking onto that, reusing that technology, not to make transistors, but to make lasers and photonic wires and modulators and detectors and all that. And then indeed you can make all these different uh, functions, optical functions, you can all make them in silicon, almost all. Okay, so how do you do it? Well, as I said, we, you go to a CMOS fab, that's one of these fancy uh, clean room labs where on large wafers these days it's all happening on 300 millimeter 12 inch wafers you can make chips and what you see here as, as an example is indeed not an electronic chip but an, a photonic chip where various structures just one example this structure is actually an optical spectrometer it splits out 
light into its different colors, for example. How do you make these in, in such a lab? Well, the, 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 the problem is that the features, the, the dimensions have to be very small, just like in an electronic chip, but that's exactly what CMOS people are used to do. They use these um, lithography machines whereby they uh, send light through a mask containing the patterns that eventually have to go onto, onto the chip and with a, with a big room, big um, system, they send light from a, from a laser through the mask and then image it into the chip and here they define the patterns to do that. Now it's well known in optics that the, the finest lines you can make uh, depend on the wavelength of illumination during that exposure step and, and the resolution is basically the, the wavelength of light divided by numerical aperture, that's a feature of the lens system. Uh, but you see wavelength here, that means that in these uh, steppers you need to use deep ultraviolet wavelengths to really make as small as possible patterns on the chip. This is how our, our computer chips are made, but this is also how our uh, photonic chips are made. And here is just a simple example of, of, a, of a passive device. This is an optical spectrometer, an uh, on-chip spectrometer. It's a fairly small device. It's, it measures uh, a small fraction of a square millimeter. It has the same function of what a prism is doing to light, splitting it up in colors. This is how it works. Light comes in from, from this side. It is being spread over all these photonic wires and they go with, with, a, with a differential delay. They go to the output where due to an interferometric, interferometric effect, light splits up in colors into the different output waveguide channels. Again, this is a small device to the same scale I'm showing here, a hair, a human hair again. Um, but with this structure, you can therefore make very nice optical filters. And you saw one output, uh, sorry, one input, eight outputs. That means eight filter characteristics, which you see, sorry, which you see, which you see here superimposed, one filter, the next filter, the next filter, etc. All of that on a small fraction of a square millimeter. Okay, um, you may wonder how do we get light in and out of the chip? Well, actually that's much easier than you may think. All you need to do is bring light vertically to the chip through an optical fiber. This is an optical fiber. On the chip, it hits this diffraction grating, which actually diffracts light from the almost vertical direction into the plane of the chip into this uh, silicon photonic wire. The way that you bring in light from top easily into the chip also means that you can test your chip before it is diced up in, in individual chips. You can take the full wafer as shown here. This is a 200 millimeter wafer and you can actually test uh, the, the chip by having in this case just two fiber probes and perhaps I'll go to this little movie. So you can make, do this fully automatically. Here you see the left fiber brings in light to the chip. It is going into this little circuit here and that the output light is picked up by, an old, by another fiber. And we, in this way you can sort of overnight uh, test the entire wafer. This is very important, the, the, the fact that you're able to do wafer level testing because uh, testing and measurement is one of the very expensive things in chip making, so therefore it's very important that you can automate it. So all, with all of that you can make chips. Here is just one other example of a chip. After you are finished with that, you obviously want to put it uh, on a test bench. Here you see another test bench where indeed, sorry, uh, here you see fibers coming in and these are RF probes. Here you also bring high frequency electrical signals onto the chip and test them uh, collectively. And after that, you want to put it into a, into a box, into a little package, and then you can move to applications. Here you see an example of where the silicon chip is actually co-packaged with 12 optical fibers bringing signals in or out of the chip. So that gives a, a brief perspective of what it is, a photonic integrated circuit and how you manufacture it and, and, and how you package it, etc. Let me now come to uh, chapter number two, uh, internet applications, transceivers. A transceiver is a combination of a transmitter and a receiver, a transmitter being a device that converts 
an electrical signal into an optical signal and the receiver being obviously the opposite, going from an optical signal into an electrical signal. Again, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, the internet is nice and Facebook and YouTube, etc. it's all nice, but there is this problem that the, on, on, on average, there is a growth of energy consumption if you take all the computers and all the data centers and all the communication networks of this world together. They consume energy by about 7% increase per year. 7% increase per year is perhaps not a lot, but that means that you increase consumption by a factor of two every 10 years. Um, already today, uh, computers and communication consumes about 5% of all electricity consumption. We heard earlier on this afternoon that all electric, uh, electricity consumption of this world is about 2.6 ter terawatt. So 5% of that is, is something like, whatever, a good 100 gigawatt. But 100 gigawatt in 10, 10 years time, that will be 200 gigawatt. Another 10 years is 400 gigawatt, etc. So that's obviously not sustainable. So we have to do something about it. Again, um, improving the optical signals, uh, the, the optical technologies uh, to bring a signal from A to B is an important part of that story. Uh, an optical fiber link is actually conceptually very simple. You have electronics creating data you send them into a photonic integrated circuits containing a light source that goes into an optical fiber containing the data being just light pulses being switched on and off. And then you go to a detector, which is another uh, photonic integrated circuit to recover the electronic circuitry. This is what we all use massively. Whenever you push Google search, you send signals around this globe by means of these technologies. And these technologies are used at the intercontinental level with fiber optic links of several thousand kilometers long, or at in, in terrestrial links, 10 to 1,000 kilometers perhaps, or in metropolitan and fiber to the home networks, perhaps one to 10 kilometers, within data centers, 10 meters to one kilometer approximately, and even at the back plane of electronic equipment, where the distances are anywhere between 10 centimeters and 10 meters perhaps. At all these levels, the only way to really transport high data rate electronic signals is by this method. You cannot do it electrically. So that's where we need these photonic integrated circuits in this box and in this box, which are a bit more sophisticated than shown here. Here is just an example of uh, one of the early adopters of using photonic integrated circuits for this purpose. This is a company in, in, in California um, called Luxterra, and already back in 2006, they started to develop these um, silicon chips, which actually contain both electronics and photonics. And with the years, they improved uh, their, their chips. Uh, and for example, here you see an example, a recent example where they pump 200 gigabit per second, so 200 billion bits per second through this chip, electronics to optics, optics to electronics, all happening within one chip. Um, at IMEC, we, IMEC is a um, non-for-profit research institute in Belgium and with quite uh, state-of-the-art clean rooms for 200 and 300 millimeter CMOS processing. So the main uh, objective of IMEC is indeed develop CMOS, te next generation CMOS technologies, but as a side activity, they put a lot of emphasis and investment also in silicon photonics into this uh, field of photonic integrated circuits. So at IMEC, we have been developing a full platform with all these passive components based on photonic wires, but then also the silicon modulators, meaning electrical signal converted to optical signal. Um, and for example, here you see an example of that being done at 10 gigabit per second, 10 billion bits per second, or even 25 gigabit per second. Um, here is the other side of the story, going from optical devices, to optical signals to electrical signals. Then you need to detect the signals that is happening in a so-called germanium photodetector. So the germanium is grown directly onto the silicon. Again, this is something the CMOS people know very well because they also need it. And with that, you can, with that, you can uh, again convert uh, 20 or even 28 gigabit per second optical signals back into electrical signals. Uh, 
So this is all quite mature now and, 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 and stable, out of fundamental research, you could say. Um, and with that, you can then make sophisticated circuits containing passive devices, wavelength selective devices, polarization selective devices, detectors, modulators, and all the likes. Here is just uh, some examples from industry. This is a field with quite some indu industrial traction. And you see examples here of both bigger companies um, in the U United States, in Europe, in Japan, but also startups. Um, Luxterra I already mentioned, Calliopa and Lucida are spin-offs from our own lab in Ghent, um, are active in this field to develop these high-speed transceivers. Again, you see examples here, 4 times 28 gigabit per second, 100 gigabit per second, etc. Um, I mentioned this is quite mature. Nevertheless, in this field, there is a lot of work towards um, more advanced solutions. Um, I didn't say much about the integration of the light source onto the silicon chip. That's actually notably hard to do. But there is a lot of activity in the world to, to do exactly that by bonding of other types of semiconductors uh, or even direct epigrowth of 3-5 semiconductors. Also for the high-speed modulators, we are looking for more compact solutions. I'll just highlight one example, integration of graphene on silicon. Uh, graphene is actually one of these 2D materials. It's, it's simply crystalline, a crystalline monolayer lattice of carbon atoms. It's sort of diamond just in one monolayer of atoms. Um, there's a lot of, uh, since the Nobel Prize uh, of, of the year 2010, there is a lot of interest in graphene. It's, a, it's a, an, an amazing material, uh, mechanically very strong, excellent conductor for heat and current. It's a so-called zero band gap semiconductor. And also it has very unique optical properties, which you can exploit for uh, silicon photonics. Let me perhaps mention that in Europe we have this so-called graphene flagship. It's one of the largest uh, research programs uh, funded by the European Union. It's a 1 billion euro project running for 10 years with, with the involvement of both industrial and uh, academic actors on, on, on this material system. What we have done in this field and achieved last year is to make, an, for the first time, a 10 gigabit per second optical modulator electrical signal in, optical signal out, um, based on integrating a graphene layer, that's the black line here, together with a silicon waveguide, that's the reddish box here. And with that, and, and, and indeed by applying a voltage across the graphene, you can modify its semiconductor Fermi level, etc., which means that the absorption of light by the graphene changes, and with that you can modulate uh, light. And you can do that in a very, very compact device, which is two orders of magnitude smaller than the conventional silicon-based modulator. But with that, let me perhaps go to my uh, second big subject. Do all of that again, but not for the internet, but do it for uh, healthcare and life science applications. And actually, I have a number of different, this is a much more heterogeneous field, and I have a number of examples here. I'll be talking about measuring blood pulse wave velocity, uh, talking about detection of proteins and DNA, the monitoring of glucose, and the detection of viruses and uh, bacteria. Let's start with blood pulse wave velocity. Doppler effect is something we all know. Um, when a source of waves moves, then the observers will see a shifted frequency, right? We know that from when the ambulance passes in the street, we see the pitch of the sound. Uh, we hear the pitch of the sound change as it passes by, as it moves from coming to you to going away from you. Exactly the same can be done in the optical domain where um, if, for example, something is moving at 15 centimeters per second, it's trivial to calculate that that will lead to an optical frequency change of something between 100 and 1,000 kilohertz. Now, the optical frequency itself may well be hundreds of terahertz, but nevertheless, this relatively very, very small frequency shift is actually trivial to measure by a so-called heterodyning technique. So now this principle is well established and, and, and in, on the market you can buy instruments like this which send out a laser beam, you send it to something to, that moves, 
the reflection from that moving target somewhere here is picked up again in the device. And after heterodyning it, you can easily measure the frequency shift and hence the velocity of the target. Exactly the same we have implemented on an optical chip. Here you see a schematic of the chip. Here is the light source. It splits up in, in two branches, so it's an interferometer. Uh, in one branch, we go out of the chip. We go to a moving target. Reflection is picked up again in the chip, continues its way. It's, it's combined with the other arm of the interferometer and can, then goes to detector. It's as simple as that. And here you see two signals. One is coming from this instrument, one is coming from the chip, and you obviously see that they look very much alike. Um, an application of all of this is medical, is in the measurement of pulse wave velocity. Whenever the heart beats, it sends a shock wave, a pressure wave through the arteries, and the, the speed by which that wave uh, propagates in the arteries, which is not the blood speed, but the wave speed, is actually a measure for the stiffness of the arteries. So in other words, if you can measure um, the pulse wave velocity, then perhaps you have an indicator for stiffness of the arteries and therefore for risk for atherosclerosis, which is a very prominent risk in cardiovascular medicine. Now, there is a method that exists for this purpose. It's called the carotid femoral pulse wave velocity measurement. But that means that you measure the delay between the pulse here in the carotid and a pulse here in the femoral, which is not a method that every family doctor will do. That's something that is being done in the hospital. So our aim is to try to develop an instrument that will move to local carotid pulse wave velocity measurement by measuring the pulse passing by here. You feel the pulse. With, with laser Doppler vibrometry, and, and a second time here, and, and in view of the delay, you obviously measure the pulse wave velocity. Here is a schematic of what we did. Here is a, a schematic of our chip. It actually contains two of these pulse wave velocity measurements, uh, uh, laser Doppler vibrometry measurements, because one is sending light through a lens to here. The other one is sending light through the same lens through here. And here you see actually one beat of the heart measured by the movement of the skin here, um, uh, taking about one second. And you see, two, you see two signals, obviously, from here and from here. They very much look alike. But when you calculate the cross correlation, you see that they are shifted by uh, something like three milliseconds, which is a healthy value, which means that the pulse velocity on this uh, volunteer PhD volunteer, of course, um, is about five meters per second, which is a good value. So this works um, conceptually. We are now moving to really making this into a prototype of what could become a product together well, with some funding from the European Union. Um, and in collaboration with medical companies, we are now developing a, a little instrument what you see here is just a mock-up. That's not a real thing. Um, a little instrument that would indeed be possibly used, which should be cheap, and which could possibly be used by every family doctor so that he will not only measure your blood pressure, but also measure your blood wave, uh, pulse wave velocity. And the two markers together perhaps give a better prediction for risk. Uh, the fact that we do this in a photonic integrated circuit is important here because what we want to do here is not to integrate two of these laser Doppler vibrometry circuits, but in this case, actually 12. So there are many beams hitting the skin here and, and the skin here, so that the doctor doesn't have to precisely align that. One of them will hit the right area and make it an easy measurement. So that was one uh, subject. A second subject is biosensors. Um, Biosensors are, meant, are, are typically used in immunoassays and uh, meant to measure the presence and the concentration of, for example, proteins, but also possibly DNA. Um, and it, it, there are actually two classes of biosensors. The conventional class is the, the labeled biosensor, which means that you do not detect a biomolecule directly. You first have to tag it with something, typically a fluorescent label. And after that, you can measure it. It would be better, of course, to work label-free, which means direct detection of the protein. So this is what we have been working on and uh, for many years, actually, now. We use a photonic integrated device called a ring resonator. 
This is a photonic wire, light comes from here. It partly couples into this ring and then circulates around and around and around. This is actually a resonator. And that means that light is also coupled out again here. And the transfer of light from here to here as a function of wavelength shows this very, very sharp resonance. Uh, actually, extremely narrow resonance. What you then do is talk to chemists to functionalize the surface of this ring resonator, the silicon, with some biomolecule, typically an antibody. And what you then do is um, let this be exposed to a fluid with blood or serum or plasma, uh, which contains uh, matching biomolecules, typically, for example, antigen. And then you get the affinity binding between one biomolecule and the other. And as soon as that happens, as shown here, you actually create a little tiny extra layer on the chip, which means that actually this resonance, this sharp resonance line is shifted in wavelength a little bit, but easily measurable. So that's the basic principle to detect that that event of binding has actually happened. And you can monitor that over time, and eventually you can, from this, uh, measure the concentration of the analyte. So this is um, what it takes to make a, a biosensor. Um, you obviously have to combine your photonic integrated circuit with microfluidics. You have to bring fluids through channels above this ring resonator. And the nice thing, of course, if you, if you can do this for one ring resonator, you can just as well integrate 10 or 100 or 1,000 on the same chip and possibly functionalized with different uh, biomolecules, which means that this is just a proof of concept demonstration um, where we took two different types of proteins and indeed one of the, well, some of the sensors functionalized with one type of protein um, detect the matching protein and other biosensors functionalized with another type of protein uh, detect the matching protein of that. Uh, uh, biomolecule. So that works extremely uh, nicely. Obviously in all of this you do depend on chemical, chemical functionalization of surfaces and you do depend on the selectivity of the affinity binding between two molecules. We did the same for, not for proteins, but for DNA. So we functionalized the surface with single strain uh, single strand DNA and then uh, detected the complementary strand with this uh, method. Uh, we are taking this now further and again we are taking it further in the direction of, of, a, of, a, of a real product. Um, we've, what we focus on, on is the detection of tuberculosis uh, through a biomarker in uh, urine and here we are really optimizing the whole approaches for simplicity and eventually cost uh, because the idea is to make a little instrument that could possibly not only be used in fancy hospitals but also in places where you do find tuberculosis typically not with fancy hospitals. Again this is something we do uh, in collaboration with uh, industry. Now, I mentioned ring resonators. The ring resonator is based on total internal reflection, but there is a second candidate for this purpose, which is the photonic crystal cavity. That typically looks like this. It looks a bit weird, perhaps, but it's just, uh, it's like cheese with a lot of holes. It's actually also a cavity um, whereby light is confined in this area, and it's, it's not confined in this area due to total internal reflection. It's uh, confined in this area due to a process called Bragg diffraction, Bragg reflection. Uh, light bounces back and forth in, in, a, in a rather complex way, but at the end of the day, it means that light really cannot, photons cannot escape this middle area. They do not manage to get through this cheese of holes. Um, and with that, you can actually make cavities with even a much sharper resonance line than what I mentioned earlier for the ring resonators. And by the way, uh, I should not, uh, I should mention really that uh, the, on a world scale, the, the, the hero of this field of making photonic crystal cavities with ultra high quality factor, a very sharp resonance line, 
is actually Professor Noda of uh, Kyoto University. Okay, um, let's move on. And my last subject is um, optical spectroscopy on a chip. Um, every molecule has a different, has a, has a wavelength selective behavior in its, in its um, interaction with light. And that happens on one hand due to what is called photon-electron coupling. Here, for example, the figure is not so clear perhaps, but what you see here is as a function of wavelength, you see the absorption of hemoglobin and also of um, hemoglobin bound to oxygen. And you see that there is a very prominent change of absorption um, due to this binding of hemoglobin to oxygen. I'll come back to that in a minute. So that's one type of spectroscopy that you could use to identify uh, a biologically relevant uh, molecule. There is a second way to do it, which is by probing the photon-phonon coupling. Phonons are the mechanical vibrations of molecules. And you can do that in two ways, either through, again, through absorption spectroscopy, like here, but then in the mid-infrared, every molecule, take it CO2 or whatever, has very strong absorption lines somewhere, which are um, a fingerprint characteristic of the natural mechanical vibrations of these molecules. And molecules are nothing else than masses with springs, which are, are the chemical bonds, so they have natural frequencies. But you can do the same by a process called Raman spectroscopy, in which case you send laser light onto the vibrating molecules, and you can sort of understand it. If a molecule vibrates, it's, it moves. So if you send light to it, you have a kind of Doppler effect. And that implies that the scattered light from the molecule is actually shifted in several ways. And these frequency shifts are actually, again, um, characteristic of the, um, uh, of the natural uh, vibration frequencies of the molecules. And with that, you can obviously identify these molecules. Okay, um, I already mentioned the um, hemoglobin. This is actually a little device used a lot in hospitals, the pulse oximetry device. It's very simple. You t just take two LEDs, a red one and an infrared one. One, you send light through the finger. And by the difference in transmission of the two wavelengths, you can figure out what fraction of the hemoglobin molecules is bound to oxygen. And if you're healthy, that should be somewhere between 97 and 100%. Now, we do the same on a chip. And here is a f what we do is we send light through these photonic wires. But you should notice that light confined to this waveguide is not 100% confined. There are these evanescent tails of the optical field which sit just outside the core of the waveguide. Um, that means that if you put a fluid on top of the waveguide, you have interaction between the guided light and the fluid. And then, of course, you can further integrate that with other uh, optical functionality. We have applied this to uh, glucose sensing. As we all know, diabetes is a, is, is a big problem. There is a, an increase of the occurrence of uh, diabetes. It's, it's even called an epidemic, which means that there is a need for what is called continuous glucose monitoring, not just prick patients twice a day and, and analyze the blood, but measure um, at least every, every 15 minutes, but not prick every 15 minutes. Um, so. Uh, actually, just like hemoglobin, glucose also has an absorption spectrum which has wavelength selective absorption features. They are not very nice, they are weak and they are broad, so they are uh, rather difficult to detect. But nevertheless, what we did is make a proof of concept demonstration where we designed a chip, um, where we have this optical chip and we run fluids, water plus glucose or serum plus glucose over them. And then, indeed, this is the proof of concept demonstration where we apply uh, a certain glucose concentration in this range, which is the physiologically relevant range. And with our device, we measure. And you do see a one-to-one -one relationship. So yes, the device works with a demonstrated sensitivity of something like one millimolar, which is about what you need for humans. Last subject is this Raman spectroscopy. Again, you see here the vibrating molecules. This is a CH2 uh, molecule. 
um, and they can vibrate in different ways, so they have different resonant frequencies, which means that indeed the Raman spectrum, this is the, the pump laser that you shine onto the molecules, and the scattered light will be frequency shifted, both towards longer and towards shorter wavelengths. And by the, uh, the, the, the position, the spectral position of these peaks, you can say, yes, this is uh, a certain molecule. You can do that also for more complex molecules, and here is an example from literature where you see that even different viruses can be uh, identified relative to one another on, on this basis. I'll not dwell into this um, because my time is over almost, but um, one big problem in all of this is that Raman scattering is an extremely weak process. Um, if you propagate through one centimeter of 100% dense material, perhaps one photon out of a million or 10 million photons has actually Raman scattered. So it's very, very weak. Um, I'll not dwell into how people have dealt with that. What we have done is use our waveguide approach where we send pump light through the waveguide. The analyte is sitting in the cladding around the waveguide and the scattered light is picked up by the waveguide again and then sent to a uh, spectrometer. This is actually better in terms of collection efficiency than the conventional approach with the Raman microscope where you have a focused laser spot and light from here is imaged onto the input slit of a monochromator. So this is a proof of concept uh, demonstration here. We took one of our spirals, typically one centimeter long, in this case, we just put a, a drop of isopropyl alcohol onto the waveguide, and yes, we see characteristic peaks popping up in the spectrum of the output light, which are the signature of um, isopropyl alcohol. And we demonstrated indeed that with that, we have an efficiency of collection of at least 25 times that of a Raman microscope. Here is an even more extreme example, and this is actually unpublished material, where we um, put a monolayer of, in this case, rhodamine onto the, onto the waveguide. In this case, it's a slot waveguide, and did exactly the same. And yet, yes, again, we see the Raman lines of uh, rhodamine popping up. In this case, the improvement of collection efficiency as compared to a Raman microscope is, is dramatic. It's, it's a million times more signal than from a Raman microscope. Um, I'll just uh, say a few words about this and then I'll finish. Uh, we take all of this one step further by putting on top of our waveguides, in this case it's no longer silicon but silicon nitride, a variation on, on a team. It's still done in a CMOS fab. On, by putting these gold nano antennas, they are really small, these are of like a few hundred nanometers, the gap here is perhaps a few tens of nanometer on the waveguide, and it's well known, uh, we already heard this afternoon about plasmonic effects, it's well known that if light comes along here in the vicinity of this nano antenna, the, 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 the electric field of the electromagnetic beam, light beam, is actually enhanced dramatically, which also means that the interaction with molecules sitting here is also enhanced dramatically by a factor a million or 10 million or 100 million. So with this, we have now, I'll skip this slide, we have now also um, uh, demonstrated uh, what, is, what is called SIRS, surface enhanced Raman scattering um, on a waveguide. And again, this is unpublished uh, results where indeed light is sent through the waveguide into interacts with the nano antennas. In this case, the nano antennas were coated with a molecule called nitrothiophenol. And indeed, we see the Raman lines of the nitrothiophenol popping up. With that, I think I should finish. Let me, as a conclusion, say that photonic integrated circuits today are becoming mainstream to continue to enable the, the growth of the internet without growing its power consumption. Um, while I truly believe, and I hope too, that I can believe that tomorrow they will be enablers for early detection, prevention, and point of care treatment of, these, of diseases in various type of simple and fairly low cost devices that every family doctor can use. And with that, perhaps make uh, healthcare more cost effective. Thank you very much.